All right, guys, we have a very special guest and a special episode of Stag and Pennies. Uh, we've been trying to line this up for months now, but figured what better <laughs> opportunity now after you won. So Eric Amarola, winner of the Dude Wipes 250 Marsville this past weekend, joins us right here on Nonsense Garage. Thanks yeah. for stopping by, buddy. Yeah, Congratulations. Thank you. thank you. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot to unpack. We'll just start with the low-hanging fruit first. Uh, congratulations. What just watching your post-race interview, seeing Alex and Abby right there in front, the front stretch, there was a lot of emotion yeah. with, with the Amarola family right there on the front stretch. What sort of emotions were going through? Well, for me is, uh, you know, obviously elation, right? Like joy for winning, but so much more than normal. Um, because of just the circumstances around it. I showed up at Joe Gibbs Racing at 19 years old and thought that I would run my whole career there, right? I was a naive little kid, and, uh, you know, I, went, I showed up to go late mile racing for Coach and JD, and they kind of had a trajectory for me, like of, all right, well, if you succeed at late mile racing, we'll get you in some truck races, and then if you succeed at truck racing, we'll get you to go bush racing, and if you succeed at that, one day you'll drive cup for us, right? And so, like, I'd sat down, and my whole roadmap was planned out. And I was going to race for Coach and, and for JD and the Joe Gibbs Racing Organization. Well, we know that that did, did, not, pan out. did not pan out like it, like it was uh, at like what it, point like did it was you realize laid out. it wasn't going to pan out like you had it hoped and dreamed? <laughs> well, really, Milwaukee. Um, that was kind of the the start of it and i'm sure we'll talk about that but i've I yeah. got the clip right here for okay you. perfect i knew you would um so yeah i think that was the beginning uh oh we're gonna look at it right now Denny hamlin's chopper yeah. couldn't land here there were cars parked on the helipad so eric almarola who qualified the car on pole i was leading to get by in, the way yeah. start the race they left yeah, they're, oh, trying pat, they're trying to pat they're trying to pat me on the back good job, yeah good guys, job thanks. yeah Made the call yeah. to put Hamlin in. It took him a while to make the driver change. They lost a lap. It's so I'm not. I'm, I'm, where I'm, are you? Uh, right now. In the air, in, in, on an airplane. In you the left. Air. Yep. Yep. And so I, I do not know right now that this is happening. I am on an airplane. Do you have smoke where, coming out of your ears? Wait, where were you going? Yep. Hold on, I'll tell you. So, uh, do I have to watch anymore? No. Okay. Um, so yeah you remember you were there oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, you want the whole story let's let's yeah, unpack the it. Whole, right, thing. whole story so i had already done this before like this was not new to go and practice and qualify the car for denny i'd done it at memphis i'd done it at irp i had done it at milwaukee the year before um this was not new my job was to go and practice and qualify the car while denny was cup uh, practicing or wherever he was somewhere else that would, you know, cause we would run non companion events back then. And so Denny would then fly in and on a helicopter and run the race and then go back to wherever the cup race was. And so this was not out of the ordinary for me to show up and practice and qualify the car. And many times that I did that, we were silly fast and he would get in the car and go have a successful night. What made this different was he was in Sonoma and he overslept Saturday morning practice. Mike Ford was his crew chief, and Denny didn't make it to the first practice that morning. He was late. And for the cup car. For so the cup whoa. car. So the plan was he was going to practice Saturday morning practice, and when, pra when first practice was over, he was excused from happy hour so that he could make it in time to Milwaukee because that's a pretty long flight from Sonoma to Milwaukee, I'd right? Say. So he overslept. Saturday morning and didn't show up for first practice gets there has to run happy hour runs happy hour Mike Ford makes him stay and debrief right to mm -hmm. make him make him pay and then he hurries up gets out of there flies to Milwaukee well they're the race is getting ready to start and I'm in street clothes standing with the B team the A team guys and the pit crew guys before the race and Steve D'Souza comes over and grabs me like they're getting ready to do like prayer. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, hey, uh, we got a problem. Denny can't land on the racetrack. They at Milwaukee. They didn't have a helipad. They had they were, He was going to land on turn three and four on the racetrack. And because it was so close to the start of the race, they told him he couldn't land. So he's going to have to land somewhere else. So they with the diversion of the helicopter. Now he's not going to make it in time. So D'Souza comes and grabs me and is like, hey change of plans you got to go drive you're gonna race and i'm like what Holy he's like cow. yeah you're gonna you're gonna race then he's not gonna make it so i take off in a full sprint go back to the hauler put on my 
fire suit that I just wore from qualifying earlier mm-hmm. that I qualified on the pole with, by the way. Um, and put my fire suit on. They're changing the seat insert out, taking Denny's insert out, putting mine in. I go strap in, climb in, run the first part of the race and lead the whole first part of the race. Uh, come down pit road when the caution comes out. The caution comes out and Ron Hornaday is in the crash. Ron Hornaday is driving for KHI at the time. My wife, Janice, who at the time was my girlfriend, um, is doing PR for KHI and Ron Hornaday. And so Ron Hornaday's in that caution that, that comes out that I come down pit road, change four tires. Like we come down lead and go out third, I think. And so I'm riding around under caution and Dave Rogers comes on and he's like, Hey man, I don't know how to tell you this. And as soon as he says, I don't know how to tell you this. I think he's going to tell me like, we got a loose wheel. We got to come back down pit road. Right. He's like, I don't know how to tell you this, but they're telling me I need to tell you to come down pit road. You got to get out of the car. I'm like, what? And you got remember, right? This is what year is this? 2006, 2007. Yep. So I'm I'm 22 years old, and I'm trying to make my career. Yeah. And so I I'm I'm not really in a position to give them the middle finger. I don't feel like, but I really want to and just stay out. And I'm just thinking to myself like I'm stewing inside the car, and mm. I'm like, if I don't come down pit road, I pretty much made my bed, right? Yep. Like I'm not I'm not listening to them. Like I'm I'm mm-hmm. my time is done at JGR. If I do listen to him, you know, maybe we, we work it out. And at the time we were trying to, we were in middle of talks with Rockwell Automation, who was the sponsor on the car, about sponsoring me the next year to go full time, to not share the car with Denny anymore. Um, so I thought like, well, I need to do the right thing here. We were at their hometown race. And uh, so I did the right thing. I came down pit road and I got out of the car. I was furious. I stormed back to the hauler and Janice met me at the hauler. She had just gotten Hornaday out of the infield care center and uh, she met me at the hauler and was like, what is going on, what's going on? And uh, so she kind of played blocker for me, kept all the media out because the media was wanting to interview me. And uh, we, I got mad, I think I tore up a few cabinets in the lounge. Oh, and, uh, with Kurt Busch style. A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. And, uh, and I think my helmet uh, might have made it through the flat screen TV in the lounge. but. Uh, she, she got me calmed down all the way through or just like kind of dead. No, just kind of dead. Okay. Yeah. I'm not that strong. <laughs> um, and she got me calmed down and I was like, I just want to get the heck out of here. Like I, I, I don't care where we go. I don't care if I drive my rental car home, but like, I, I do not want to be here. And she said, well, let me ask Corelli. C- Rick Corelli was t- the team manager at KHI. She said, let me ask Corelli. Um, I think we have extra seats on our team plane and we're obviously crashed out. So you can go home with us. So she asked Corelli. Corelli was like, yep, no problem. We'll take you home. So I flew home with her on the KHI team plane. And uh, when I landed, obviously found out that Denny won. So what's the next week look like or the next several weeks? <coughs> so you said yeah. <laughs> prefaced with it didn't go how you had hoped or wanted yeah. to. So was that like a, I don't know, not a warning, but like a, like this is how it's going to be. Yeah, so that was that was the first time for me being a, uh, you know, naive, innocent, just not exposed to the business side of our sport yet, right? Like, I was still drinking the Kool Aid, right? Of everything is wonderful, and I'm gonna be the next best thing, and all the stuff that you know management people and mm-hmm. uh, agents, right? Like tell you. And so I'm, I'm, I'm drinking that Kool-Aid. Well, that was my first experience of like, no, this is a business, man. This is, it's cutthroat and everybody's going to do what's best for them. And you need to start thinking about that. Right. So I had my eyes open in that event and in those circumstances. And because of that, um, that started my shift in the way I thought about things. Um, and so, yeah, I, I started looking at the reality, like, all right, well, You've got Tony Stewart, you've got Denny Hamlin, you've got Bobby Labonte, you've got other guys like that you're looking at. They were looking at getting KB to come over to drive the 18. Um, oh, actually, yeah, they didn't have Bobby Labonte. They had J.J. Yaley, and Yaley wasn't um, you know, having the best of results, so they were looking at getting KB to come drive the 18. So I could kind of see the writing on the walls, like, well, this is going to be tough to replace any of these guys that they're going to have, and unless they start a new team, highly unlikely. Um, just for me. So I started to evaluate like, well, what does this mean for me? And at the same time, 
I got a text message um, and from Mark Martin says, hey, give me a call. And Mark called me, and, and so we started talking. He's like, man, I can't believe they did that to you at Milwaukee. You kind of played into my emotions oh, already. Uh-huh. And he's like, hey, by the way, um, I need somebody to help me run like 14 cup races next year, and I think you'd be a great fit. And I was like, mm, let me think about that. And so I went, and that whole next couple of weeks, like obviously everybody at Gibbs was sorry and you know like they were glad that it worked out they won but they were sorry that it hurt my feelings and they offered me like the trophy and the oh prize money God. and all that stuff and the i was trophy. like trophy yeah they're cool. like well you're you're a part of it right like and you actually get credit for the win and i was like man that's the last thing i want like i don't want a trophy from a race that i didn't finish the race in well you, you can um, tell that it was still an unhealed womb because 17 years later when you mentioned in your post win yeah interview yes you knew you i knew you had like that was a long standing thing that you wanted to square up yeah yeah so it's it's deep like i had that buried for a long long time you know and and just you know you time yeah i say time heals and it i don't i don't know that time heals just time makes it less hurtful right Uh, it hurts really bad in the moment you feel like you let it go after that like do you feel like this win kind of gets that deep wound out yeah i'm done with really it. yeah i mean i that and, and i think that you see that in the post-race interview and and for me just the level of excitement that i had right like and and no disrespect to the xfinity series because it doesn't matter what you race it doesn't matter if you race a go-kart race or a foot race or whatever it is like it feels good to win right um but you know racing cup as long as i have it's expected sort of like when you go down to the Xfinity series, you go down the truck series, you look at Kyle Busch and you look at Denny when he jumps in a Joe Gibbs racing Xfinity car. And you look at Larson when he gets an Xfinity car, like those guys get in and everybody expects them to win. And typically they do. And so I felt like those expectations were there for me, but more importantly, I had expectations of going to win because I wanted to clear that slate, right? Mm. Like for me to go and to go back to Joe Gibbs racing. Do you think Joe did too? Yeah, I do. Did I you bring re- it up? Um, no. Really? Just never brought it up. But he did call yeah. you. Yeah. So how'd that go down? End of the year, last year? Um, yeah, so so we'll back up again um, to when I was racing for them. When that whole deal went down, it was summertime, and Coach had went back to go work for the Redskins. He went back to go coach the Redskins at that time, so he wasn't around the shop all the time, but in the summer, that summer he was. And so when that whole deal went down, I remember I got called to coach's office and I went and met with coach and JD and I, I was a young kid. Again, I was 21, 22 years old and I was brutally honest with them with how that made me feel like I was respectful, but I was very, very honest with like you. I felt like you guys did me dirty on that one. Like that, that did not feel good. Um, and I'm really hurt by that. And so then a few fast forward a few weeks, I, I, I go in there and ask if I can be released out of my contract to go drive that cup car with Mark Martin and share that car. And JD was shocked. Um, and, and I could tell he was a little bit hurt that I would come and ask that, but he said, absolutely. I'm not going to hold you back from any opportunity. I care about you as a, as a person more than I care about you as, um, you know, a, a driver at Joe Gibbs racing. And he said, I want what's best for you. And um, if that's what you want to go do, I want you to go do it. He said, but I hope you'll come back someday. And I remember that conversation And JD from that point forward, JD, I mean, we already had a great relationship. JD was an amazing man and spoke a lot of life into me, a lot of, a lot of truth and, you know, shared the gospel with me and was always questioning me on like where I was at in my faith and on my walk with Christ and asking me why I kept living in sin with Janice. And he's like, <laughs> you, dude, you're broke you are you're a nobody and you got this beautiful girl like why don't you just hurry up and marry her and quit living in sin (laughs) and uh you know janice and i got married three years post me driving at joe gibbs racing and jd was at our wedding so i just think that speaks to how much jd meant to me and how much i meant to him um and so you 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 fast forward to now and for coach to call me coach called me and said hey are you really retiring this time it's like yes sir i am and he said, well, if you are, he said, I got, I got something I'd like to talk to you about. And he kind of spelled out what he wanted. And 
uh, wanted me to come back and be a part of the organization. He, he said, I knew you, I know you meant a lot to JD and you mean a lot to our family and, and we'd really like for you to come back. And he said, I, I would like for you to come back and finish your career where you started. And so we talked about what that would look like and we landed on where we're at. The, the biggest reason why I appreciate you as <clears throat> not only a competitor, but as a friend is just how uh, we've had so many conversations. We've been in small group together for, I don't know, five, six, seven years in the Cup Series. And yep. uh, just how JD has breathed life in you, you've breathed a lot of life in me just to paint the perspective of how hard that wrestle and that balance is. Of I remember I was driving over here, I was thinking about when you were in the playoffs 2018. I think you went like full monk. Like, I'm not going to hang did. out with my family. I'm yeah. going to prepare 24 hours a day. You swung the pendulum all the way. I did. Right, and you've swung the pendulum back the, all the other way. Yeah, and you've worked everywhere in between. You've had great perspective in between. So, how do you strike that balance? How do you wrestle with it? Like, what is, um, dude? There's just so many questions wrapped up in that. How do you sure. hold the resu- results loosely? How did, how does your faith play a part? <coughs> Man, of how your career went. That's funny. You bring 2018 up. So yeah, 2018, my best year ever in in the Cup Series. Um, made the playoffs, went all the way to the round of eight, uh, just just barely missed going to race for a, a championship at Homestead. I finished uh, third at Phoenix, but I was battling for the lead with Harvick and Kyle Busch at the end um, to, to win the race and, and almost had a shot to go race for a championship that year. F- ended up finishing fifth in the points. Um, just a, an amazing year. But, I yeah, that was my first year at SHR. And I remember like thinking like, I'm going to make the most of this opportunity. I'm going to do whatever it takes, like full commit, sacrifice everything. And when I made the playoffs, you're right. Like I, I, we were, <laughs> we were remodeling uh, our house. And so the the main floor of our house, our master bedroom and like the living area and kitchen and stuff. And so Janice and I were living in the basement of our house and obviously the kids upstairs. Um, and so I remember just coming home from the shop. I spent a ton of time at the shop. I was going to be fully committed. I was going to the simulator. I was going to sit down with my, you know, engineers. We were going to lunch with the crew guys. We were taking the pit crew guys to go golf, like full in every single day, doing something with my team and just like all in. And I remember at the end, right, I finished fifth in the points and it was extremely gratifying. And the reward certainly met the, the work, which doesn't always happen in our sport because everybody works hard, uh, but in that particular instance, it did. But I put a incredible strain in that 10 plus weeks on my marriage, on my relationship with my kids. Like I was completely checked out. And th- I realized at the end of that, that what really matters is having success and sharing it with the people you love, right? Like to have success and to go home to an empty house I don't think that that's worth it whatsoever. And so that was eye opening for me. That whole experience was very eye opening for me. And I kind of shifted focus and, and came up with a, a new mindset of even if, like, even if I finish last in every race, I'm going to do it with the people I love and I'm going to be more uh, devoted to my, you know, my, my Christian faith and, and all. I'm going to put my priorities straight is basically what I came to the conclusion of. And I don't care if I want to win a championship. I want to win every single race. But at the end of the day, like, that's not the most important thing. Like, let's get the most important things right. And then if those things happen, great. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, that's okay, too. I had this talk with your wife yesterday. You weren't standing there. Uh, But because I do the same. Like, when we get in the playoffs, just being a picker guy, like, I'll do the same thing. Like, the deeper you get in the playoffs, the more the walls come up. Yep. And you only have 24 hours. So if you're doing more self-care, more uh, whatever, just on your craft, yeah. and especially in the Cup Series, it just the, the hit comes at home. Mm-hmm. So now if you're struggling, and I just had this talk uh, an hour ago, I was sitting at lunch with a crew chief that walked in. When you're struggling in the Cup Series and you're putting more time into it, then you're struggling there, then you're struggling home as well yep. because it lacks. So now you feel like a failure everywhere. Everywhere. Right? And it's a lot of people don't see that. And then... It's just there's so many layers to the sport that people don't understand because they see it on TV, and, th- and that's what you are. You're, as a professional athlete, you're judged 
on TV. That's part of the Absolutely. game. Absolutely. But like you said, even going back to what happened there, people didn't realize that you were – what happened uh, in Milwaukee, people didn't realize you were in talks with sponsors, and there were yeah. so many more layers to the cake of why you were upset. Yeah. It wasn't just, oh, I was going to win this race. Right. right. And, yeah, we Kelly actually brought it up yesterday. She's like, Corey's going through a funk right now. I'm like, yeah, it's tough. And she said that you feel – that's why I think it's good, and people don't understand that, that that you guys do have like a small group where guys get together. Yeah. Because when you're at the and track, especially vent. well, <laughs> but especially when you're at the track, yeah. dude, that could be the most lonely place, right? Because you can oh, get is. done. I would say this weekend, right at Martinsville, mm-hmm. yeah, which I was stoked to see you and your fan, your little yeah. boy, and because let's go. Yeah. He was <laughs> fired. My favorite up. one where he was like, ah, yeah. let's go. <laughs> yeah, your daughter runs and gets the flag. I was like that because like when I go, people are always like, why do you go short track racing? I do this stuff 36 weeks a year yeah. and then you go do that in the winter and I'm like this is why like yep. they get to be here and do it with us because yeah. we love racing we all love racing but you don't get to bring your family with you a lot of the times and I think the coach lot when you're racing like I would say this weekend just knowing you you're fast in practice you're happy then you go have a tough qualifying lap and you feel just like everybody bus, you feel like but you feel like your team hates you that you're there with right because you feel like you let them down and then you feel like a failure yourself and then you go back to the bus and then you are in a crappy mood and you might get quick with the like sharp oh, with yeah. the kids and you feel like a bad dad and you're like i suck right now and that, yeah, that a lot of dude. people don't understand that side of the sport it affects everything right like in, in Corey and i've talked about this a lot in small group and in you know going to lunch together or whatever like it's so hard to find that balance of like holding it loosely right like trusting god with the results and just putting the effort in that you need to and then like not getting so wrapped up in the results because the results matter like they really do like they yeah. affect everything the the results affect you know whether or not you get sponsors and how you know how how much your team appreciates you and and they ref, they affect your pay right like that's yeah. a huge one and and then now they affect your pay and then the, your results you know typically determine are you going to get another contract are you gonna, yep. like it just self confidence con- right it just continues to snowball and in in good or bad yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. so that's the that's the hard part and that's the balance and that and that's the thing that I always struggled with as well as a you know, as a competitive person, as a race car driver, is that we're in a performance based business. You have to perform and you have to perform at a high level. But what are you willing to give up for that? Right? Like I think you can look at anybody who has been uber successful and they sacrifice a tremendous amount to achieve that. You have to. Look at any of them. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, I'll, I mean, look at Tiger Woods, right? Look at Michael Jordan. Look at Tom, Tom Brady. Brady, right? Like all of those guys, highest achievers of all of their sports, probably not the most proud of their home lives throughout their entire career, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you, no matter what, you can't be great at everything. It's impossible. Um, you, there's always something willing to, you know, they're not willing. There's always something that's going to sacrifice. And you as a person have to figure out what that's going to be. And for me, I, I came to a point in my life and in my career that I was, I was willing to sacrifice not being the very best race car driver to make sure that I didn't ruin myself as a human being, but also, you know, more importantly, ruin my relationship with my wife and my kids. Dude, that's, and that's, that's a wrestle. That's the, that's a, a, a polarizing take right because some yeah, people say you're there yeah and you should put everything at risk because there's also because they don't see it they're not there yeah they're not, they're not there, there right they just they well there's somebody waiting in the wings that's saying that i'll do, do that. that right right and so i think yeah and and i you know you we could get in the weeds on a lot of things but like i i think it's really having a family and being a professional athlete is a blessing and a curse Yep, it really is. And 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 my I'll talk openly about this. My wife knows this, but like, if if you want to be extremely successful and be a professional athlete, it's probably way better to not be married and not have kids, right? Because you can be a hundred percent all in, and you are mm-hmm. not you're not hurting anybody's feelings. You're not you're not missing time with watching your kids grow up. All those things. So you look at the guys like in the Cup Series, and in yeah that they have more opportunity to be more all in and then they also have opportunity hey you get home from a saturday night race or a sunday night race at two in the morning they can sleep in till noon guess what as a dad you're still getting up at 6 30 because your kids are jumping on the bed right So, so like so there's a whole other side of it but the blessing side is is that good days 
you get to you get to share those moments with the people you love more than anything else. The bad days aren't so bad because you get to go home to the people you love more than anything else, right? You don't go down go home to an empty house. So I think it's it's certainly yeah twofold. So I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you this. So now you're on. So you're done racing Cup Series. Yeah. No Daytona 500. <laughs> I'm I, sure may, you've been asked. Maybe, yeah, potentially. sure. It pays pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it might come back. Um, but week in, week out in the grind, you're done with that. Yes. So you did it for what, 16 years? Yeah. Now you're 16 years removed, looking back at your Cup career. Mm-hmm. What do you consider a success differently now than when you were in it? Oh, man, that is a deep, deep question. That's what I'm wrestling with right now. <laughs> That's why I asked. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because the outside world views success as multiple wins a year, battling for a championship, yep. right? And the reality is, is that there's 40 cars on the racetrack every given weekend. Only one guy gets to win. There's 39 losers. Um, the reality is, is that not all teams are equal. The reality is, is that not all personnel are equal. Right. Like the best teams win because the best teams have the best resources, the best equipment, the best people. They have, you know, all, all of the extras. Right. Or magic is Chris. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, just like, magic. <laughs> it, it, it's it's true. Right? And, sure. and so um, it's never one thing. It's, it's never everything. one thing. It's everything. Right. And, and, and your show is called Stacking Pennies. Right. Like and it literally is like you're putting all the details together. Um and, and so success as a race car driver is really hard to define because baseball, right? A, the most successful hitters of all time bat 330, right? So a thousand times they get up to bat, they hit the ball 330 times. So that means that 570, or is it 670? 670, five. a third, two thirds of it, they fail. Yeah, yeah. they fail. Right, crazy, crazy, crazy numbers. Six, seven, six hundred and seventy times they get up to the plate and they either hit into a ground out, pop up, or strike out. Like, so for a race car driver, and they got more confidence than any other athletes there is. Right, because you have to. All right, but now hold on. So that's two thirds of the time they fail. One third of the time they have success at the plate. A race car driver in a great year wins. A great year wins five races. Right. I mean, I know there's occasional, there's exceptional years where guys will win eight or nine races, but a great year, a team wins five races in 36, right? So that's way less than one third. Yeah. One third of 36 is 12, right? So you, and that's so the at, tip of the spear. That's the tip of the spear. So, at, so as a race car driver, compared to any other sport, you are going to fail way more than you succeed. Um, from a pure, like, just results perspective, winning and losing. And so it's it's really hard to answer that question. That's why I asked. <laughs> I know. Would you put an answer on it at all? I don't think you can. I think yeah. I think only you know. Yeah. And, and I think that that's where I came to my conclusion is that only only I know, right? Like, only I know how hard I'm working inside the race car. Only I know how much time I'm sitting at home after I put the kids to bed and I'm sitting up at the kitchen counter on my computer looking at SMT, only I know how much time I'm spending re-watching old races. Only I know how much time I'm, you know, willing to put into the team and, and all of those things. And then only I know, you know, how good I really am or, or, or aren't, right? Like, and, and so I think that that's, for me, that's, that's where I finally came to grips of, like, I wanted – Every driver that straps in wants to be the very best, wants to be the next Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, Dale Earnhardt, you name The list goes on and on, right? Um, I felt like when I was at my best and when I was in the best race cars that I could race against anybody. But I wasn't always at my best, and I wasn't always in, my, in the best race cars. And only I know that. Can I tell you how I answered that question? Do what? Can I tell you how I answered that question just yeah. recently? Because I got to ask that question. Yeah. And I'll see if I'll see if it, um, I'll see if it kind of aligns with what you think. So we won the championship last year. Yep, successful year. Yay! Uh, in my answer. position, like not a driver, but in my position, right? You give as much to the sport. Eighteen years of doing it, and some we went to the banquet, and some of the young guys were like, "Hmm, this is it." I said, "Guys, if you're doing this to try to go to the banquet, and this is what's going to make you happy, that's not what it is." For me, the reason that I've found joy in doing this job 
is falling in love with the Tuesday film reviews, the working with the guys, the van rides, the stuff that gets taxing, but like you kind of fall in love with the grind of it, but then also being able to cut that off because you don't get too obsessed with it. But like the, if you're doing, if these kids are doing it for the Instagram posts and the driver intros, like nobody really like that's yeah. So, so that's so small of it. And like even race day for a picker guy is the tip of the iceberg, right? You yeah. Do eight pit stops. You might do a thousand pit stops in a year between yep. practice and the race and maybe 90 or a hundred of them are at the track, right? Yeah. It's the, all the other stuff. Like, and, and I, I heard a pit coach who's actually a pit coach at Gibbs now, Brian Holland would say this, the haze in the barn, yeah. right? The work's done. We're that's just, right. we go to the track just to have fun. Right. Yeah. But it's the, it's the grind of the week and getting better and working together and not getting so caught up. Like the results are what the results are the results, right? Yeah. That's all it is. It's a result of what you did. So like, let's focus on what we're doing. And that's where I've found the most happiness is like working with my guys, getting better and that showing up at the racetrack. Um, yeah. But, but you just answered how to find, how to find joy. You didn't answer how to, what, what is success? Well, I mean, yeah, it's opinionated, but, yeah. but it's sure. the, the success is where you find the happiness. So I guess I can go deeper. The success is working getting better and that's showing up when you go to the racetrack that's where the success is like yeah being but, better than you were like I, but, I mean, to Corey's, I but to Corey's point it. like but to Corey's point like you can also in our sport and especially as a race car driver you can work in, and I think what you do is different like and I'm not taking anything away from you but like if you are really good at your job it shows and if you make a mistake it shows right as a race car driver you can be you can drive a 25th place car with all of your might like you can drive the absolute piss out of it and finish 24th yeah. nobody cares no <laughs> you finish 24th well yeah. right like yeah, nobody cares loser right but like you you know in your heart and you're yeah. the only person that knows like i got the most out of that thing today right, right? and you're you can go person. you can go home and sleep at night knowing but then there's but there's still the flip side of that of like I finished twenty fourth. Yeah, I suck. Yeah, why didn't I finish twelve? Right, we suck. Like, <laughs> yeah. and then and you just get in this like spiral. Oh my god. Well, the worst I'm part for drivers is like spiral. for for me, I can be better than people and go get a job. Yeah. Right, and it's like, hey, your numbers are better. Yeah. For you guys, it's like, hey, your numbers are better. How much money do you bring? <laughs> um, yeah. What like what? Okay, well, we got three spots on the B post. You can have one. Like, there's so many layers that. Okay, well, you're better than this kid, but this kid brings more money. Like, that's the inner workings of what you guys are dealing with. Yeah. Starting, I mean as early as the summer but for you right like for you when everybody used to be able to build their own pick guns right yeah well, so it like cost me a job for right sure. so it's like oh well like is flores good or is he not or uh -huh. does he just have a really good pick gun or yeah. does he have a shit pick gun yeah, or yeah. am i allowed to say, is he am I allowed to say yeah yeah, yeah. But oh, yeah. crappy does he have a crappy pick gun or what like mm -hmm. you know it's like yeah like there's always, yeah, there's always like something now obviously everybody on the yeah, road has the same yeah. thing it's different but like so for a driver that you have you you have your ability, but then you also have the tool you have to work with, and the tool yeah. you have to work with is the race car. And some days your team gives you an amazing race car, and as a driver you expect to go and perform with that race car. When you have a bad race car, you still have to go perform with it, but nobody sees it. Yep. Right. You it looks can, the same. It looks the same. Yeah. Yeah. Punching above your weight class in the Cup Series is so hard, but it's not sexy. He talks about that a lot. That's right. It's hard, man. That's it why is. we keep showing up to do it each and every week. Yep. Uh, let's lighten the conversation up yes, a little bit. We'll land this plane. Um, so now, right, you feel like this weight of expectation of winning a Joe Gibbs car in Xfinity Series is lifted off. How yep. many more races do you have in it? What are you expected or what are you excited about for the rest of the season, Ochi? Um, I want to win more. I mean, yeah. yeah I where, think, where do you go next? Uh, Darlington. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. So that's a – that's a favorite of mine. So, yeah, I think I'm going to run 15 races total, and I've run four. Um, so, yeah. I've oh, got a decent got, amount. Yeah, so I've got 11 more. I'm going to run Darlington, Charlotte. Uh, That'd be fun, New Hampshire, man. New Hampshire, Indy. Dude, you kicked yeah. everybody's ass in New Hampshire. That one, when yeah. that freaking thing took off, yeah. I remember that. I was like, oh, my Cl Just Cliff knows, yeah. Cliff knows version four. We've had SVG on. He's talking about some differences between Xfinity and Cup Cars. You yeah. drive, you've been driving the next-gen car now since yep. it came out. Now you're going back to Xfinity car, a really good one at that. Brief explanation of just some of the some, some of the differences of the two cars. Well, I know the topic of more, more horsepower has been really high on everybody's list, and I, I've always been a proponent of that because when I came into the Cub Series, we had 900 horsepower, and 
when you race your whole career going up through the ranks and you finally step into a cup car that has 900 horsepower, you're like, oh yes, my goodness. like yeah. this is amazing. Right. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I feel like the fact that they've kind of dumbed it down to 650 horsepower or whatever does stink for the guys that like aspire to get there. And then you get there and you're like, this is it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll say the Xfinity series, they make about the same horsepower. Um, but going from running the cup cars for the last several years to running Xfinity car, Xfinity car is so much more fun to race, right? To race the actual race craft of it, being able to manipulate the car in front of you by being able to get close to them, get on their left rear quarter panel and pack air on them and move them out of the way without even actually touching them. Um, you know, or actually you can touch them and like move, literally yeah. move them out of the way where the cup cars, I mean, you can run it, you can smash into the back of them and it just propels them forward. Like you can hit them right in the middle of the corner and it doesn't yeah. do anything. It's like Tetris. Yeah. Um, so, so I think for me, like going back to the Xfinity series, it took me a minute. Like my first race was Vegas and I was like, whoa, they move around a lot. They're squirmy. They yaw out. They, they just drive so different than the cup cars. But then once I got in the race that weekend, it was like, this is fun. Like you're searching all over the racetrack. You can run right in somebody's tire tracks. I mean, for three years when I've been driving the, the next gen car, if you drive in somebody's tire tracks, like it won't be for long. It won't be for long <laughs> because you're going to be 10 feet that way in a, in a four wheel in, de- in, in a minute, death right? Like you just have absolutely no grip behind the other car and the Xfinity car. If you just get your left front headlight six inches out, a foot for sure outside, you know, to the inside of the car in front of you, you have just as much, if not more grip than the car in front of you. And you can actually race. You can get, you can build a run, get momentum to, to get to them. You get to their bumper and pack air on them. They're in trouble. They're loose in, they can't get the throttle down. Like you can actually affect the car in front of you by being, you can be on offense when you are behind And right now, from watching the cup races and from driving the cup cars myself, um, when you are behind, you're trying to pass that car, but you're also trying to not get passed by the car behind you because sometimes you can try to pass that car and it's so impossible to pass that car that you will make mistakes and end up giving up a spot. Mm. Um, And so you get everybody going around the racetrack playing defense nobody's playing offense yeah except the the leader right yeah. like and and so that's what that's the biggest thing that i've noticed just going to xfinity racing um it is that the cars are just more enjoyable to to race the race craft and the way that you can you know run behind somebody in their tire tracks and move around put it on somebody's door make them loose right stuff like that you i i just i think it makes for better racing problem is there's a lot of a lot of that toothpaste squeezed out of the tube we can't put back in with this. That ship rod. has sailed. It's, it's yeah. sailed that ship buddy. has sailed. But I think I do think that there is ways, or, or at least I would hope that um, NASCAR could figure out ways to make the cup car um, not be so, you know, the air. all the air is fed underneath the car. And so the cars run like this, and, and you know, you, you look at how powerful the diffuser is and all that stuff. Um, the Xfinity cars are not that way, right? The Xfinity cars run with the tail up, the, the splitter sealed off, and um, the airs, you know, the downforce is made on the outside of the car. And for years, we, we talked about how bad the cup racing was, you know, at the end of the old car. Um, but that was when ride height rules went away, back of the cars got slammed to the earth, right? And, and, and don't look very different, right, from, from what we have now. And so I'm not mm. saying it needs a complete overhaul, but just for somebody to figure out how to get the next-gen car for when the lead car is out front and somebody is closing in from behind, that they can get close enough to actually make that lead car drive worse. Because that's what the Xfinity cars have right now, and it is awesome to race those cars as a driver. I don't know. I don't have an opinion from a fan's perspective, but I just know that as a driver, being able to maneuver my race car kind of where I want it and try to think about, as I'm catching somebody, how to be on offense and attack and to be able to do something that can manipulate that car so I can pass it. Mm-hmm. And right now, that's what the cup cars are missing. Oh, I'd agree 100%. Um, I got, I got and we, and we, could also, we can also spend about another hour talking about that alone. But before you leave, I got three questions we asked all the guests. Can okay. I ask one question before yeah. you go there? Yes. Because I was thinking about this on the way over. Ask them. Because like, we've skipped over your time at the 43. 
Oh, yeah. We haven't talked about that. Yep. And I was thinking. I can um, come back sometime. Yeah. No, I we'll just want to know one thing. Okay. Do you have, wait, is there one, because like I remember being on the 21 and getting to go to Stort and hang out with those guys. Yeah. Is there one Richard Petty, Dale Inman, or Richard Petty, Dale Inman story of like, man, this is pretty cool that you, that you remember when you drove a 43 car? I have too many of them, honestly. I was there for six years yeah. and was awesome. Like Richard is, and Dale, and like the, Richard's great human being. Like 200 wins seven cup championships like if anybody in nascar deserves to have an ego and to be like cocky and walk or walk around with their chest poked out it's richard petty and he doesn't do that he's just an amazing human being and so i've learned a lot from him uh but the times i got to spend together with him uh, one of my favorite times was we he took us all multiple times to his house in wyoming uh, is, is so, that when you yard sailed that one yeah <laughs> <laughs> i was there for this yeah one. But, like, we would go, yeah, you, you did, you went out there. Yeah. Um, we, we would go to his house in Wyoming, and we would spend a week between the West Coast races, so between Vegas and California or whatever. We'd go out there, and we would spend, you know, Sunday night, we'd leave whatever cup track we were at, we'd fly to Wyoming, and we'd spend Sunday night till Thursday in, in Wyoming. And we'd snowmobile, and we'd go into town in Jackson and just have a great time. And seeing him out of his cowboy hat and sunglasses and cowboy boots just seeing him as Richard Petty right not the king those are my favorite times because you got to almost get to see behind the Wizard of Oz curtain right mm -hmm. like yeah and, and and to to be with him in that setting and he's comfortable he's in his house he's with his families with his friends he's with you and just to see him in that moment and sitting around a dinner table and eating and sharing a glass of wine um that those were those were the the best memories that i have of being with, with richard so one of my memories from one of those trips uh he's he says snowmobiling modestly he's got like had i think he sold his place right yeah i think it was like this three bay there had to be 15, 20, 15, 20, 15, 15 snowmobiles. Sleds. Yep. All, and we'd Polar, go all Polaris snowmobiles. Fueled all, up. all lined up, fueled up, ready, ready to, to go. rock. And you would just go yep. into Foreverland. Yeah. Right? You just go. Mountains, snow, the whole snow thing. taller than you can see over. Uh huh. And if it's a little Christmas tree sticking out of the snow, there's probably a 15 foot tree underneath that. So you don't want to run your snowmobile by that tree. Right. So Brian Moffat, the king's son in law, dad's dad, is an excellent snowmobile rider. There was this mountain dude that he would go up, and there was this little tree that you would go, and you had to be full commit. I'm talking, like, on the wood, don't crack it, off the back, to get up to the back, to just, like, turn it and go back down the hill. He did it, made it look easy. Yep. You did it next. <laughs> it did not go so easy for you. No. I don't know if you hit a bump or something, and it kind of, like, nosed over, and just, like, slow motion bro mm. so it, yeah yard windshield handlebars so i grew up i grew up <laughs> on a lake in florida and so i've rode you know jet skis and wave runners and all the stuff my whole life but like those when you turn like you actually lean into the turn right and so i i got on a snowmobile it's like yeah no problem, yeah, no problem. It's, no it's, four it's yeah it's four wheeler it's a jet ski however when you're going up a mountain and you go to turn, if you lean into the turn, now you're, the, the weight, the gravity is pulling you down the mountain. And I did not think about that. And so I'm you know, trying to bonsai up this hill and I get up to the top and I'm going to turn and I lean into the hill. And as soon as I lean the snowmobile high sides, and I'm like, oh boy, and I jump <sighs> off. And when I jump off, it rolls over onto the seat then I see the skis, then it goes back down, and, and then it starts gaining speed, and it's like, to doom, to doom, to doom. <laughs> and before you know it, it gets down to the bottom of the hill, and the, every plastic piece on it is yeah. blown oh. off of it. It's got steam coming out of oh, it yeah. everywhere. I was next. Yeah. I was like, I'm ready to go, and I was like, I'm just going to – when's lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, you're welcome back anytime. We'd love right. to chop it up more with you. I What's your three questions? Three questions. Yeah. If you had to pick one car and one track to race at the rest of your life, what do you go with? Oh man, um, I Which would car Milwaukee. Uh, no, <laughs> um, I would say the the old Cup car with 900 horsepower at Dover. Mm. Talk to me. Love that. Uh, question number two: What's the most embarrassed you've been 
at the racetrack? Uh, most embarrassed I've been at the racetrack was I went to a test. I was I, I had just started um, running some truck races and bush races for Gibbs, and I went to go do an ARCA test. Uh, which was a real cup test uh-huh. um, at Talladega with the whole Gibbs like R and D cup team, and we went there. We were going there for a three day test to make their speedway program better. And on day one, we I went out and made a couple runs, and then on one of the runs, they wanted me to shut it off and coast all the way in for something for their data. And so Did and you get the fence. Yeah. So hold on. So I shut it off. I coast all the way in, coast back to pit road and I'm still coasting foot left foot in on the clutch coasting. And I went to turn in between the opening to go back to the garage. And I don't know if the, I was going too fast. I probably was going too fast. And when I turned, it didn't turn. It took off in a push. And I went to go hit the brakes, and the brakes were pulled, pulled back. back. And mm. I center punched the 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 pit wall, and that was on day one of a three day test, and killed it, totally destroyed it. So we loaded up and went home. <laughs> I felt I was twenty years old or whatever. I felt yeah. about that big. Oh, that's a that's a great story. Yeah, mm. not great, not great. And nobody to knew be it, you. right? Like, yeah. no, it wasn't on national television or anything. Uh-huh. But like, just everybody in the shop, of course, the next day. Yeah, you know, it just it was anybody yeah. still there from that test when oh, they go when you, like, when you go yeah. really yeah all the same guys yeah that oh. that is one of the coolest parts about going back to joe gibbs racing you know 20 years later is a large majority of the people that were there when i was there originally are still there like shapiro and them guys yeah there? really yeah That's wow cool. all right last yep. question yeah if you had to lose every single one of your racing memories and keep one what do you keep oh man um I'd probably say Saturday night at Martinsville. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I winning at Talladega um, in 2018 was really special. Alex, I, I, I still remember, like, victory, like, celebration on front straightaway, um, do my interview. I drive backwards on the front straightaway, turn onto pit road, and I'm coming down pit road the normal way, give a few drivers and stuff high five. Um, don't even remember who, but like I remember doing that, and then I remember seeing in my windshield Alex in his pajamas, yes, and Janice carrying oh. Abby in her pajamas because she yeah. she had them already like uh-huh. pajamas loaded on, up for the plane. loaded up for the plane yeah. ride home. <laughs> and so Alex is, you know, he's like three or four years old, and he is running as fast yes. as this little four year old can run at me. I'm driving towards him. Janice has got a big smile on her face. She's carrying Abby. Um, that was a really, really, really special day and like a memory that's just like really ingrained in, 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 in my brain. Yeah. Um, but Saturday night was pretty awesome. Like it felt like as soon as I got done doing my burnout and put the window net down, Alex was like in my face and yeah. it was, it was cool. Tell, tell the story though, when you land after Talladega. Oh uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. So I've, I've told you that. So, yeah. um, you know, and that's a, that's a faith-based story um thing that was kind of an eye-opening moment for me as well so 2018 i'm at full monk mode like yeah. don't care about anything else just want to race just want to win just want to run for a championship i win talladega after having a shot to win the previous week so previous week i'm leading at dover just absolutely just dominating at the end of the race clint boyer brings out the caution with 15 laps to go been or there something, right been yeah, there before right and and so so I'm, I go from leading to now we're going to have a restart with less than 10 laps to go. What do we do? Do we pit? Do we not pit? Do we stay out? Do we take two? Do we take four? Whatever. We come down pit road, take four tires. I restart sixth. Two cars Two cars stay out. Two cars get two tires, whatever. I don't know. I restart sixth. I go, we, they drop the green flag, and I try to run through turn one and two wide open, three wide. Don't make it off a of two. Hit the fence. Uh-huh. Wreck half the field and uh <laughs> and, and and i was just so upset and so like dejected and i went home and was like that's it i quit like i'm <laughs> i'm I, I had the best car i should have won i didn't win i ruined it everybody's mad at me you uh-huh. know and 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 just so dejected very next week go win talladega put us into the round of eight in the playoffs um and, and so such a great moment I was sharing a, a plane, uh, Paul Menard and I chartered a, a plane to Talladega and home. So Paul and, and Jen and his kids were on the plane and they waited. They had uh, they had some adult beverages waiting for us when we got to the plane. And we, we had a great ride home. 
we get home Janice the kids fall asleep when we land in Concord and drive drive to the house the kids fall asleep in the back of the car we get them up get them tucked into bed Janice and I go down take showers crawl in bed and I'm like ah Sunday night it's garbage night so I literally get up throw some gym shorts on and a t-shirt on put my slide my flip-flops on walk out and go take the garbage out and walk it out to the road and it's midnight or after it's pitch black you know there's there's no more fans there's yeah. no celebrating there's nothing it's me walking <laughs> up my driveway <laughs> carrying my trash can out and it was such a realization for me in that moment of like today was awesome but in the grand scheme of things life still goes on and it does not matter like to to the garbage man you are just the you are house. you are just the next house that the garbage needs to be picked up at and so yeah, it was it was, uh, it was an eye opening moment for me on like what really matters. Mm. Well, Eric, thank you so much for the time. Congratulations yep. on Saturday night, buddy. Yep. You're welcome back anytime. Eric, I'm roll. I'm stacking. Yep. Thanks for having me.